Hi, welcome. I am Pamela Nadell, Director of American University's Jewish Studies Program, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the third webinar in our new series, Europe's Jews Before the Holocaust, where we spotlight the authors of four important new books on this theme. Our series is co-sponsored by American University's Jewish Studies Program and our Center for Israel Studies with the generous support of the Knapp Family Foundation. As always, I'm delighted to join my colleague, Professor Michael Brenner, Director of the Center for Israel Studies, in bringing exceptional programming to our campus and the wider community. I especially want to thank the Center's Managing Director, Laura Cutler, for making all that we do possible. I know that everyone at American University wishes to extend a warm welcome to our audience today. You include AU students, including those currently enrolled in my class on Holocaust history, friends near and far of AU and of our Jewish Studies program and our Center for Israel Studies, alumni and academic colleagues from around the country. Welcome to all. So now it is my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, today's moderator, Dr. Lauren Strauss. Dr. Strauss is scholar in residence and, um, and director of undergraduate studies in American University's Jewish Studies program. Her scholarly focus is on American Jewish political and cultural history. She is completing her book, Painting the Town Red, Jewish Visual Artists, Yiddish Culture, Culture and Radical Politics in Interwar New York. Her museum consulting work has included Cleveland's Maltz Museum and DC's own Capital Jewish Museum, which is currently under construction. I'm delighted to turn the virtual microphone over to Dr. Strauss. She will inter introduce today's speaker, Dr. Natalia Alexian. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pam. It's uh, wonderful to virtually see everybody out there. And I'm so, so pleased to be uh, moderating this very important conversation with Natalia Alexian. Uh, Dr. Alexian is professor of modern Jewish history at Toro College at the, at the Graduate School of Jewish Studies in New York. She is the incoming Harry Rich Professor of Holocaust Studies at the University of Florida in Gainesville. And she holds doctoral degrees from both Warsaw University in Poland and New York University. She specializes in social, political, and cultural history of modern East European and Polish Jewry and in the Holocaust. Dr. Alexian has written extensively on the history of Polish Jews, on the Holocaust, and on Jewish intelligentsia in East Central Europe, Polish Jewish relations, and on modern Jewish historiography, as we'll see today. In addition to her 2021 book that we're discussing today, Conscious History, Polish Jewish Historians Before the Holocaust. She is also the author of a book uh, whose English title is Where to the Zionist Movement in Poland, 1944 to 1950. And she has co-edited several volumes, including Pauline Studies in Polish Jewry, uh, volume 29, and European Holocaust Studies, uh, Places, Spaces, and Voids in the Holocaust. She also edited a critical edition of a book that, whose title, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce because it's only in Polish. Natalia, maybe you'll enlighten us. Um, she's also co-editor of East European Jewish Affairs, the journal. Currently, she's a senior fellow at the Polish Institute of Advanced Studies in Warsaw. Uh, and she's coming to us today from Poland through the miracle of Zoom. She is completing a new book that she has already um, started, not only started, but is very deeply meshed in researching about Jews hiding in Eastern Galicia during the Holocaust. I really look forward to our, con our conversation after Dr. Alexian presents her talk, I will be in conversation with her for about 10 minutes, and then we will, uh, and then we will turn it over to questions from the audience. So turning it over to you, Natalia, thank you. 
Thank you so much, uh, Lauren. Thank you for this uh, wonderful introduction with the uh, with, um, Polish titles, uh, Pitfalls. Uh, uh, but uh, um, actually, I will come back to that title, uh, I think, in, in our conversation, um, because it, it's a broader context of the writing of uh, Jewish history, both before and after the Holocaust by Polish Jews. Um, and I'm thrilled to be part of this series. I would love to be there in person, but um, I'm grateful for the technological miracle that allows us to come together. And I hope that the miracle continues uh, until this webinar uh, is over without um, interruption. Let me now uh, uh, share um, the screen, um, which will take us through my uh, talk today uh, that is uh, based on, on the book uh, that Lauren mentioned, Conscious History. Uh, but I want to also point in some directions that the book did not cover or did not focus on or the questions that uh, remained uh, with me um, already uh, after the book was uh, finished. Um, but I want to start with uh, one case of uh, serendipity uh, that I only became aware of when, um, when the manuscript was ready. That is this young woman, Franciszka Wiesenfeld, or as she here writes her short vita um, in application to be uh, accepted to the University uh, of Warsaw to study history to the Department of Humanities, uh, and she gives her short uh, life uh, consisting of um, birth, place of birth in Krakow, her studies in primary and high school, her high school um, uh, final examinations, and her study in the, in the Institute of uh, Jewish Studies in Warsaw. Uh, I will come back to it. And now she wants to become a student at the University of Warsaw as well. Um, I read her file, I read her uh, um, dissertation, which is in, in the university archives, and only when the book was over did I realize that I actually met her. Only uh, did I meet her as Safrira Azrieli, as a mother of my first Hebrew teacher at uh, Hebrew University in Jerusalem many years ago, when uh, Rachel Garber, my teacher, took me to meet her uh, mother, who was thrilled to meet um, a woman from Poland. Uh, I was at that time still a doctoral student in Warsaw and very much wanted to share with me um, anecdotes about her student life uh, in Warsaw. Uh, and I didn't realize that I will be writing a book uh, about it. I did not record and I did not ask her all the questions that I wish I had asked her uh, many years later. But in that way, really, um, uh, the, the files and the personal encounters uh, came, came together. Um, Wiesenfeldówna, or uh, Safrira Azrieli, um, left Poland in 1937 for Palestine, for mandatory Palestine, and therefore she's part of a very small group of uh, young Polish um, Jews um, interested in writing Polish Jewish history that survived the Holocaust. And I will come back to that question of continuity at the end. You see her here uh, on a list of um, dissertations written uh, under the tutelage of Professor Meyer Bauaban, the pioneer scholar of Polish uh, Jewish history. Uh, she's here on a list. The list is alphabetical, three page long. And in the book published in 1938, um, uh, the editors promised that um, in the near future, another volume of the uh, festschrift dedicated to Bauaban on the occasion of his um, anniversary, another book with um, uh, research of his students would be published. Of course, this never happened. All we have is a list. But I want to point your attention, while it is in Polish, uh, and I'm gathering very few of, um, of us 
together gathering here on this webinar um, can decipher it. Nevertheless, what's striking already is the number of women among these young students of Polish Jewish history and the variety of topics um, from institutional to cultural uh, to uh, literary studies to political history and local history. And I'll come back to it. Um, I want to introduce you to uh, the focus on my book, of my book, which is this cohort, this group of young Polish Jews, many of them women, some one third of uh, Meyer Bałaban students uh, who were pursuing a degree in, in the history of Polish Jews were women. Uh, who came from very uh, diverse backgrounds from all over Second Polish Republic, um, who uh, were interested in the topic that to some extent as a field was only beginning to emerge. Um, and most of them um, published very little uh, uh, or just a handful of, of articles uh, some of their uh, work is uh, available, survived in the archives of Warsaw University, but some of these files, even student files with their work, uh, were destroyed during the war. Uh, the one name that I think we all uh, recognize, uh, thanks to the masterpiece, uh, uh, the, the, the book uh, written by Samuel Caso, who will write our history, is Emanuel Ringelblum. And he's primarily recognized as a founder, a creator, organizer of underground archive uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto, Onek Shabbat, Onek Shabbos. Uh, but as Caso uh, uh, shows in, in his book, the roots of his work in the Warsaw Ghetto were very much in his student years in the Second Polish Republic. And that's why I put here um, also his uh, diploma, an image of his doctoral diploma for the dissertation he had written about the history of Jews in Warsaw in the early modern period, a dissertation that was uh, published as a book before, before the war. And that identity of an academic with a diploma, of a published academic, part of the scholarly community um, of historians uh, was very important to Ringel Bloom and to this cohort uh, in general. It was also uh, very important to the man who to some extent was responsible for creating a venue and cre creating an uh, institutional setting for young Polish Jewish men and women to study Polish Jewish history, that is Meyer Bałaban. He was himself trained before World War I. Uh, first, uh, he studied law, then decided to uh, devote himself to uh, Jewish history and Polish Jewish history specifically. In 1937, when he celebrated 60 years of his academic activities, and there was a big party organized at the Jewish Institute, at the Institute of Jewish uh, Studies, um, he made a speech where, in which he recognized that incredible moment in which he sees as someone who was among very few uh, engaging in research on the Polish Jewish past, how he now sees a cohort, a generation that emerged that will continue his work. Of course, this is a very dramatic moment when he makes the speech, when the book with the speech is published in 1938, and uh, we know the fate of many, uh, if not most, of his students. But I want us for a moment, and in this book, this was also an, a certain intellectual um, and emotional exercise to put aside the long shadow of the Holocaust and look at this experiment, social, intellectual, communal experiment of writing Polish Jewish history without knowing the tragic end. And that experiment starts in late 18th century, continues through 19th century with uh, contributing um, amateurs, both Jewish and 
non-Jewish uh, who uh, are interested in a Jewish past, but these three men that you see here, Mayer Bawaban, Ignacy um, Itzhak Schipper, Mojash Moshe Shor, were really essential for transitioning of the field of Polish Jewish history into the field of professional history. They were all trained either in um, Lwów, Lviv, Lemberg, in Krakow or in Vienna. Uh, they uh, published in Polish scholarly journals. Uh, they published books. Uh, their activities focused on in uh, what was until 1918 Galicia, that is the part of partitioned Poland that belonged to Austro-Hungarian Empire. And it is not an uh, accident that uh, many, but not all, of young Polish Jews pursuing their degree in Polish Jewish history were also Galicianers, that is uh, coming uh, from Galicia. But we also have, during the interwar period between 1918 and 1939, we have a dramatic geographic shift. While before uh, World War I, Lwów, Lviv, Lemberg is a welcoming a center in which uh, people um, seek ways to study Polish Jewish history. There are also Polish academicians who are uh, interested in um, Jewish research on Polish Jewish topics. Uh, that shift moves, that, that center very much moves from Lwów to Warsaw to the capital of the uh, resurrected uh, Polish state. And it is in Warsaw that um, this cohort, this project of writing about the Jewish past, of writing Jews into Polish past, emerges. Um, and it emerges as a minority history uh, that is written uh, by uh, Polish Jewish men and women who are very much aware of their situation in Poland a, uh, and as, as citizens of the Second Polish Republic, but also as members of a minority writing for that minority, and at the same time writing uh, for that minority's sake, meaning writing in order to create a certain narrative context, a certain justification for civic rights, for equality, for Jews, to be treated as uh, belonging to Poland rather than uh, uh, foreigners. So uh, uh, that um, project focuses in Warsaw in two places. One is the Institute of uh, Judaic Studies. And you see here a picture taken in 1938 of some of the students um, at the door on the stairs that exist today. The, the building today is the Jewish Historical uh, Institute. Um, and very important institution created in 1927. But there is this other side, just like we saw earlier, the uh, application of Franciszka Wiesenfeld, who studied at the Institute of Jewish Studies, but who also studied at the university in Warsaw. In fact, uh, Jewish students enrolling at the Institute of Jewish uh, of Judaic Studies were obligated to become students at one of the Polish uh, institutions of higher learning. This was different from uh, the policies applied, for example, by um, Evo in Vilna that did not require uh, young people uh, studying, uh, coming to study there. Uh, to be enrolled in Polish institutions. And vast majority of these students who are training to become rabbis, to become teachers in Jewish schools, to become social workers uh, for uh, Jewish communal institutions, vast majority uh, enrolled in the Department of Humanities and pursued degrees, wrote dissertations and thesis about the history of Jews in Poland. Now, um, there's a whole uh, number of reasons and I consider in my book and I continue thinking about them why they would choose that topic and not other uh, aspects of history, uh, other aspects of um, Jewish history. Uh, there was a department of Semitic studies, 
there was a, uh, there was a department of sociology. There were other venues uh, to pursue, but this focus on history seems to be uh, very clear from the files. Uh, one of the reasons I think uh, is the particular uh, atmosphere that um, prevailed at least until uh, mid 1930s in the Department of Humanities and the newly created Institute of History, which was really single-handedly almost shaped by Marceli Handelsmann, uh, a, a Polish Jew from a, a assimilated, acculturated family, a Polish patriot, um, a follower of Piłsudski, who uh, created or uh, shaped this institute to be an inclusive institute in terms of uh, student body, in terms of uh, faculty, and in terms of vision of the past, especially vision of Polish, of the history of Polish lands. He was the person who supported the appointment of Mayer Bauerban to become a chair of Jewish history at the Institute in 1927. Uh, this is before Salo Baron, uh, became a professor at Columbia University. And uh, at the same time, for example, he was interested in bringing Ukrainian historians to the Institute. So that history that would be written and, and the kind of history in which students would be trained was not a history of Polish lands limited to ethnic or Catholic Poles, rather um, an inclusive um, history of all uh, inhabitants of these lands. Now, I looked at the courses that Jewish students tended to take. Uh, these records are available uh, for at least some of them. And it's very clear that they tended to choose certain professors. I'm assuming that these were professors that were more welcoming than others. Uh, many of them were uh, medievalists, such as Jan Kochanowski or early modern uh, history scholars. Stanisław Arnold, who was very supportive of uh, Emanuel Ringelblum. Uh, there was also a degree of interdisciplinary interest. Many of these uh, young Jewish historians would attend classes uh, taught by Stefan Czarnowski, whom you see here uh, on, the, on the picture, who was one of a very few uh, Polish intellectuals who spoke very clearly and very forcefully against uh, so-called ghetto benches uh, before they were formally introduced at Polish uh, universities in uh, the second half of 1930s. And uh, Czarnowski was known to be very supportive of uh, Jewish students attending uh, his lectures and his uh, seminars. And this, this is the question that I asked myself, and I continue really asking myself, having completed the book, the degree to inclusion, the degree of inclusion of Polish uh, Jewish historians in the interwar period, to what extent they really became part of the historical profession in Poland. And there are several ways of trying to measure it, the degree to which their work uh, uh, was uh, reviewed by non-Jewish scholars and cited the degree to which they they were invited to uh, participate in um, very prestigious um, biannual meetings of Polish histori historical profession. And this is one of those examples of inclusion, which is a Jewish history panel that was organized as part of the International Conference of Historical Studies that met in the summer of 1933 in Warsaw. And some of you may be recognizing this is basically who is who of Jewish history. Uh, here is Salo Baron, uh, uh, here is Meyer Bauerban, here is Raphael Mahler, Ignacy Itzhak Schipper, whom I mentioned earlier, and Philip Friedman, another historian of the younger generation that I will hopefully get to um, towards the end. So um, what does it mean that this meeting organized by Polish historians who are welcoming a historical profession uh, to Warsaw in 1933 uh, organized this, this session? Most likely this was because of the support of Marceli Handelsmann, whom I mentioned 
earlier. And this is in a way um, a symbol of inclusion. At the same time, uh, in Jewish press reports about this particular session, uh, unfortunately, you couldn't really um, tell who participated in terms of the audience, you know, who came to the session, who asked questions, who was inter interested in Jewish historians talking about Jewish past and, and talking about methodological questions. Um, and the only name that is actually mentioned by a, by a Jewish reporter is a name of a Ukrainian uh, historian. So that would be interesting, would suggest you know, that one minority historian interested in what other minority historians were doing and how they were doing it. And not to paint the picture too rosy, uh, especially in the 1930s, the atmosphere at Polish universities, and that includes Warsaw University, is certainly worsening. This is the entrance to the main campus. Um, history, uh, Institute of History was when you crossed that gate um, a little on the right, uh, some um, 60 meters. Uh, down the, 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 the lane uh, in the middle. And you can see here uh, banners hanging with calls for um, uh, ghetto benches and, um, and death to Judeo-communism. Um, even uh, Meyer Bawaban experienced some violence, although more verbal and symbolic than direct. Um, Marceli Handelsmann was walked by students from tram stop so that he would not be assaulted. He was protected, uh, literally protected by uh, presence of students who were devoted to him and who would walk him from the tram stop to the, uh, the door of the institute. Uh, and students themselves experienced uh, daily uh, hassles. The Institute of History, though, remained a much more welcoming, especially in comparison, in comparison to uh, medicine and law. Um, and so uh, I think we can, we can look at the um, study of Polish Jewish history in the 1930s to some extent um, as a kind of a bubble uh, if you compared it to uh, other social situations at uh, shared spaces in the Second uh, Polish Republic at that time, including universities. But while uh, it was very important for Bałaban and for his students to be part of Polish academia, they were also part of Jewish intellectual discourse and Jewish culture, which meant um, writing not only in Polish, but also in Yiddish, uh, that was very important for Bauaban, for, uh, for Ringelblum, uh, that is Bauaban less so. Uh, but among the young generation of historians, Bauab, uh, uh, Ringelblum uh, among them, and here is um, Bella Mandelsberg, uh, a colleague of his uh, who, like Ringelblum, was uh, a member of the Zionist, left wing Zionist coalition. Uh, small, a party, a Zionist party that was committed to Yiddish culture and to uh, creating secular culture in Yiddish. That included writing about Jewish past in Yiddish, but also writing about particular kind of Jewish past, writing about um, working class Jews, writing about um, uh, class conflict, writing about difficult conditions in which Jewish uh, uh, craftsmen existed. Um, and that was the reasoning behind the creation of a very unique uh, journal, uh, only four volumes uh, appeared, uh, two under the title Junger Historiker, Young Historians, and two under the title Blätter für Geschichte, Pages uh, of history, for history, uh, but all in Yiddish, uh, there was only table of content in Polish. And if you were to look at those, you see where the interest of young generation of scholars uh, was, was going. There was some local history, but a lot of, um, uh, of their research was social and economic history. 
I'm also very interested in the kind of people that engage in the study of, of Jewish past. And uh, here it's, it's really piecing together from very, very limited sources. Um, and one of the most important for me were those student files you saw already, um, a picture of um, Franciszka Wiesenfeld and her application. Here is another application of Pani Krasińska, uh, who also uh, writes about her path leading to this application. Unfortunately, students were not asked to talk about their goals or what motivates them. Uh, these are very formularic um, um, uh, statements. Um, also, they had to say that they are of mosaic faith that needed to be clear in the application. Um, but uh, what I would argue based on, um, on, on these applications is that there is clearly a motivation in writing uh, studying Jewish past and then writing about Jewish past because these were students that were often coming from quite far away. Uh, many of them had universities available that were closer to them. Um, and so if they came to Warsaw, they came to study at one place in Poland where there was a space for studying and writing about Polish Jewish past. I'm particularly interested in one woman. Uh, I don't know what happened to her. Um, her uh, name is not on any list of survivors or in, uh, in the list of uh, victims uh, for that matter. Uh, she um, was from Łódź. She studied and wrote under Meyer Bałaban and she wrote a remarkably contemporary dissertation uh, about uh, the history of Jewish women in the early modern period, demanding that Jewish history should uh, be more inclusive of the uh, experience of women and how Jewish history really has this tremendous gap uh, in not thinking through that lens. Of course, she doesn't use the term gender, uh, but really it's there, even if the term is not uh, cited. I don't know whether she came with this topic, whether this was a topic proposed to her by her advisor, which was the, the habit at the time, but she is clearly very much committed to pursuing not just Polish Jewish history, but pursuing it from that angle of, of experience of Jewish women. This is also a generation that is not only multilingual, but has this um, intersectional, um, as it were, uh, identity in terms of their uh, languages. Um, here, um, they needed to declare twice a year their um, citizenship, their nationality, and their um, mother tongue uh, together with their denomination. And um, you see Sarah Eisenstein declaring uh, Hebrew as her mother tongue, a completely improbable uh, scenario. Um, she was a woman, she came from uh, a very modest uh, family. It's extremely unlikely that she would speak Hebrew as her mother tongue in Łódź. It was most likely either Yiddish or Polish or both. Uh, but here she makes an um, ideological statement. Um, but also other students fluctuate. They sometimes put one um, uh, mother tongue, sometimes another. Uh, and you see how uh, languages are part of um, their toolbox that allows them to pursue uh, this new field. I mentioned a little bit of um, the importance of local studies, and this is in a way one a very strong uh, direction in which the scholarship went. Uh, here you see Ringelblum's uh, book, um, his doctoral dissertation published in a general, very prestigious uh, Polish scholarly um, uh, press with the support again of Marceli Handelsman. And um, he, in the fragment that I um, uh, put in a slide, he uh, stresses how much 
uh, there was an interaction, a conversation between Jews and Christians uh, living together in Warsaw, uh, or an, in, his, in his words, there was no Chinese wall. And so this is something that a lot of these local studies um, better and in a more compelling or less compelling way, way are trying to do. On the one hand, to place Jews in the space of all these Polish towns and cities in the past, show that Jews had lived in these places for hundreds of years, and at the same time, um, to make sure to show that they were part of these towns, that they did not live separate existence. Um, and I believe um, uh, Ringelblum mentioned that, um, Bauerbahn mentioned that um, in, the, in the testimonies of, of his students, uh, they saw in the past a proof of possible more positive, more inclusive, more integrated future in which Jews could become part of Poland without ceasing to be Jewish, but living together, not apart, not with that Chinese wall that never existed in the past. Another important aspect of this historical production, um, and that points, I think, to a, a situation of a minority, uh, to a sense of insecurity, uh, was writing about the Jewish uh, participation in Poland's struggles for independence. This is an absolute obsession of Polish uh, collective uh, memory uh, during the interwar period um, of the newly recovered uh, statehood, um, celebrating, commemorating many um, um, uprisings and, and uh, um, military efforts to regain independence throughout the 19th and early 20th century. And the Jews write themselves into, as it were, into that struggle. Uh, Ringelblum writes about it, uh, Bauerban writes about it, um, and uh, this is something mentioned in many pieces and dissertations. Jews are loyal, patriotic, uh, shed blood for Poland, from the beginning of the partitions until the World War I, until uh, the struggle, uh, and they participate in the uh, legions of Poland's uh, uh, strongman and leader, Józef Piłsudski. Uh, this is the kind of scholarship that is not only academic, uh, um, articles about it are published in Polish language and Yiddish language press. This is very important to sort of give Jewish readers that sense and the, the, the kind of arguments about their um, commitment uh, to Poland, their rights to be at home uh, in Poland. And again, back from that uh, involvement with the Polish audience and the Polish political social cultural context, uh, this is still a minority history, uh, a history that is very much concerned about protecting uh, documents, protecting material culture from the past. So just one example, an appeal published in a highbrow literary journal, um, Literarische Blätter, um, signed by, again, who is who in Eastern European Jewish history writing from Shimon Dubnov to Mayer Bauaban, uh, Ignace Schipper, uh, Raphael Mahler, and Emanuel Ringelblum, appealing not to historians only, but to everybody to collect uh, Pinkasim uh, communal chronicles. And these documents would uh, have a place, a home, um, would have had rather a home in the future new archive that was devised or envisioned by another student of um, Mayra Bawaban, uh, another Galicianer, um, a Jew from Galicia, uh, Hillel Zeidman, um, who uh, envisioned creating the central archives of the history of Polish Jews, uh, something that maybe is 
uh, close to what we have today as the central archives of the history of the Jewish people in Jerusalem. This archive, this archival uh, center never came to be, but he envisioned a place where all these documents would find a way and would be kept for future historical uh, research. But historians who studied at the University of Warsaw obviously did not have academic careers open to to themselves. They knew uh, from the beginning that they would be uh, working more as public historians while pursuing other, other paths. So uh, I look in the book at some of them, some of these paths through which historical narratives were disseminated. One of them is through military rabbis, um, sermons, prayers, um, prayer books, uh, that are all steeped in historical narratives that uh, were uh, practiced and performed by young Jewish men drafted annually to the Polish uh, military. Um, even more importantly, uh, teachers, teachers teaching, especially in Jewish gymnasia, but also in Jewish primary schools. Uh, here is one such teacher, Falik Hafner. Um, who would often take their students to a local, um, to see local monuments of history, to Jewish cemeteries, to Christian cemeteries, who very much uh, engaged in, um, with their students in historical research. Um, history is also played out uh, by Jewish political representatives in the Polish parliament and city councils. These uh, speeches made and by them and published by Jewish press also uh, include a lot of references to Polish Jewish past. Now I ask myself, and this is something that I would like to end with, the question of continuity. Uh, I showed you uh, Franciszka Wiesenfeld uh, not only uh, because she uh, survived, uh, but also because she spent her many decades uh, in Palestine and then in Israel as a teacher, as a teacher in, uh, in um, public schools, uh, teaching uh, history. Uh, and I found a lot of uh, students of Polish Jewish history uh, shaping to some extent the understanding of uh, Jewish history uh, uh, already um, after the war, uh, away, far away from Poland. One of them is Shevach Eden, whom I had the pleasure to still interview in Jerusalem, who worked in the Israeli Ministry of Education, um, and uh, Israel Biderman, who was the head of the Youth and Education Department of the Jewish National Fund uh, of America, I interviewed his, uh, his wife uh, in, in Brooklyn, who uh, was not only involved in, in that kind of his public history, but who also, as you can see, uh, continued in a way the path of local history by editing uh, Iskor book, memorial book of his hometown, uh, Wotswavek. And the biggest question of continuity, of course, are Philip Friedman, uh, who um, survived the Holocaust uh, in Lvov, um, who uh, headed the Central Jewish Historical Commission um, in, in Łódź, uh, and who ended up um, teaching and researching uh, um, at Columbia University uh, with the assistance of Salo Baron, and who became a pioneer of uh, Holocaust uh, history and historiography. And this is a question again for maybe another book, the extent to which his understanding of, uh, of the Holocaust as part of Jewish history is really deeply rooted in his experiences as a historian of Polish Jewry before the war. And last piece, all these local studies, this is very much how uh, Jewish history Jewish history in, the, in terms of history of the Holocaust was beginning to be written after the war. Among those, you see here the book that um, was mentioned in the introduction, Zagłada Żydów Żółkiewskich, The Destruction of 
Zhukiev jewelry. So from local histories to local histories of destruction. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Am I on? You see me? Wow. Uh, Natalia, thank you so much. That was incredible. Um, and uh, it's also really useful for me to digest everything that I read in your book and hear you distill it um, and bring out what to you are the most important points to share with an audience. But I do need to uh, begin on a personal note, a, a personal for you. And uh, you really open the book on a personal note. You share, uh, and you shared in your presentation today, all of these different nooks and crannies of your own experience juxtaposed with the experience of researching the book and also the existence of this entire community of scholars. Um, the incredible serendipity of meeting the mother of your Hebrew teacher and the fact that she figured into your project. Um, so to me, I see this as a real asset in your case, uh, breathing life really into your characterizations of not only the people as, as much as you could while acknowledging that, that many of your materials, uh, potential materials have been destroyed, but also breathing life into their project and into their entire communities. Um, I'm wondering while you were writing, whether you felt like you had to employ any kind of correctives or, or limits on your, own, on your own incredibly strong feelings about this project, or do you feel like you more drew strength from that connection? This is such a great question, and I mean it. Um, I think um, I was in denial about how personal this project was. Uh, and uh, it started as a, as a project in historiography. Um, I was inspired by uh, David Meyer's incredible book, uh, Reinventing Jewish Past. And I thought to myself, mm, this is such an interesting way of thinking about history, history writing and historians. I wonder what would do if um, I was to apply that kind of um, intellectual um, breath to, to Eastern European Jewish historians. Um, and really only when I finished did I realize that, um, that yes, I mean, this is a profoundly, in a way, a profoundly personal uh, project. Um, also because I studied my first uh, degree in history was uh, from Warsaw. I was literally studying in the same, um, in the, walk, walk the same corridors and studied with, uh, with students of, uh, I guess, academic grandchildren of um, Marcelli Handelsmann and his big and large black and white picture was uh, hanging in the reading room of the Institute. But, uh, but I think in a way, I was so engrossed in the academic aspect of this project that I, allow, I, allow, I allowed myself to, to, realize, um, uh, to realize the uh, personal connections uh, much later. And I think that helped. I think that otherwise um, um, it would have been maybe more muddy to to engage in this. I felt more like I was doing a, a detective work, uh, you know, trying to find bits and pieces um, or, or bring it together from bits and pieces that I was finding. Well, that, uh, that really connects to another question that I was wondering about your process, about your research process and perhaps the connection between your experience and these early 20th century extraordinary uh, projects of collecting material that you describe in your book, these, the ethnographic expeditions, which were of course also in Russia um, and uh, collecting internal Jewish communal records, as you mentioned, the Pinkasim, and visits to Jewish cemeteries uh, to glean information from headstones. So, um, uh, I was wondering if you felt like you were an inheritor, an inheritor of those kinds of treasures, 
Um, and I also wondered in terms of the idea of grassroots collecting of historical materials, uh, you know, this is something that we're seeing recently, these crowdsourcing projects that um, even the, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum here in, in DC um, began a number of years ago, encouraging visitors to look at their, um, uh, their own hometown newspapers in the 30s and 40s to read through those for how they were covering the Holocaust and also recent uh, requests for people to collect pandemic era um, right. experiences. So, um, so I'm wondering how you think having the perspective of, of older grassroots uh, projects, how do you think these kinds of efforts affect the, if you will, professional writing of history? Yeah, I think, um, well, how it will affect in the future, um, this is a great, a great question because I, I, I think there is in a way two contradictory um, processes here. On the one hand, um, it's the availability of, uh, of uh, material. Uh, I was able to go to Lvov, Lviv, uh, right, just a few years before I started being interested in a project that would not be a, a given at all, uh, I was able to look in the into the archives of the military rabbis, which is in the Polish military archive. So, um, on the one hand, comparing with uh, you know early '90s or or, or before. Uh, I, this is a wonderful situation. I mean, maybe not if you're interested in in Russian history, but but Polish Jewish history, uh, a lot is opened uh, or even scanned. Um, but at the same time, like you said, I felt like I'm working, and as I became increasingly interested in the story of the people rather than the story of writing itself, um, I felt very strongly uh, the dearth of ego documents, the kinds of materials I would have loved to have, right? The memoirs, the diaries, the testimonies. And so, but I decided to really treat it as, as, as part of the story, that this is a project about libraries and 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 huge collections of letter exchanges that exchange exchanges that must have existed right i mean bawaban wrote with everyone um and i had just traces you know um, um hillel zeidman's uh, wife uh, shared with me uh, letters of recommendation that uh, his professors wrote for him. And I thought to myself, there must have been all these other letters of recommendation, but I'm seeing just a tiny bit. And I need to extrapolate uh, and kind of imagine the, the material culture of, of this project that is no longer um, existing. But I, you know, I finished writing and I'm still, um, I still wish uh, I could find uh, uh, letters of, of Sarah Eisenstein and, and, and know what drove her to write this brave uh, gender-driven manifesto. Right, right. You, you'll never be done. You'll never. <laughs> I, I, I say that as a, a very positive uh, comment because this is really is so rich. Um, I'm going to turn to some great audience questions that are, are rolling in. And, uh, and first I'll start with, it's interesting, I was, I was going to ask you this myself and my colleague Lisa Leff uh, was on the same wavelength, um, noting, Hi, your, <laughs> noting your, uh, the, the fact that you point out the number of women who are students of Jewish history and in particular students of uh, Meyer Balaban on the one hand, and their, the existence of their, their work, but on the other hand, the photo that you showed from 1933 of this group of historians sitting at the table, I had the same yes. immediate reaction, um, you know, that it's completely 100% male. Uh, and so I, I, I'd love you, and, and Lisa would love you to, to comment on that. I'm also, if we can broaden it a little bit, I'm wondering whether the existence of this, uh, this unusual percentage of women students indicates some kind of greater diversity in this community in particular, perhaps compared to other more conservative 
communities at the time. Um, like I'm thinking there are, uh, there are historians who come out of this milieu that, that you discuss who also write a lot about class consciousness, for instance, Raphael Mahler and, uh, and the Zionist historians. So is this greater diversity in gender and perhaps um, ide uh, ideological outlook, is that somehow reflective of their uh, of this community and 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 where are yeah. women in that photo? That's a, that's a great question and, and one that I keep on asking. Um, so uh, yes, I, I always uh, think about this uh, fantastic picture uh, of um, you know important men in 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 history uh, at the time um, and uh, Bella Mandelsberg Schildkraut. Uh, in terms of generation would have belonged together with um, uh, Ringelblum and uh, Friedman at the table. And in fact, um, when, um, when we discuss or recall uh, the emergence of uh, something I didn't mention, uh, I didn't want to take the, the entire afternoon um, uh, for this ve webinar, uh, the Junger Historiker Christ, the seminar for the study of Jewish history. Um, and Ringelblum is always credited as one who uh, organized it, who initiated it. But in fact, Bella Mandelsberg was also um, among the, the founders. Uh, so uh, this is a question. The, the, on the one hand, this, that seems to be a progressive um, uh, cohort, right? Um, uh, these are Bundist, left-wing Zionists. Um, uh, many of these women, uh, as far as we can tell, again, from very short, painfully short bios that um, Emmanuel, uh, that Raphael Mahler uh, published uh, in an essay about this group, many of them went from uh, Hasidic homes into left-wing Zionism and then to communism. Uh, but historians of these, um, uh, um, so cultural historians of, of this political engagement uh, have long pointed out that they were often quite traditional in terms of gender relations, uh, even though you know the banners might have had other things written on them. So I think that there is a degree of this happening, although I tried, for example, to count the number of articles written by women that were published by the, in those four volumes uh, created by young uh, Jewish historians in Yiddish, and women seem to be very much uh, present there. But if you move to, let's say, Polish, uh, um, um, prestigious Polish journals, uh, it's mostly or almost entirely um, men, um, Jewish men who, who who are um, included in the in the conversation, uh, but I think, and I want to stress it. Maybe this was not clear enough. That what I find fascinating in this story is that this is a project interrupted in mid sentence, uh, right? This is this is Bauerban saying, you know, hooray! Uh, even if I don't get finished my work, they will. Th these young people will continue, and we are beginning to have enough to start writing synthesis because we have all these um, micro histories and we can now move to the next level. This is 1937, 1938. So um, it would be interesting to see um, how gender plays out, you know, if this project continued, but there is clearly a tension and, and certain discrepancy. And thank you, thank you very much for pointing it out. Yeah. I think that's an old story of, uh, you know, progressive circles that right, are progressive you're writing in certain about ways, New York. but right, uh, me about the women. Um, and uh, we have a very specific question from Shelby Shapiro, um, who wants to know where Jay Shatsky figures into your research. Is that... Janka Shatsky, yes, thank you for bringing him to, to, to into the conversation. So he is and he isn't part of, of this uh, conversation. Uh, he uh, writes a dissertation. I actually found the manuscript of this dissertation in Jerusalem. Uh, one of these you know, stories of, of Polish suffering under Russian rule and, and Jewish part in it. Um, um, he, um, he has the support 
of um, Shimon Ashkenazi, another fascinating figure that I didn't mention, but I do write about him in a book. Uh, but he goes through a, through a moment of, of very strong um, disappointment. Um, and while this project, I argue, remains hopeful uh, throughout the, even throughout the 1930s, Shatsky kind of gives up. He is sent to investigate um, the, um, the context of the pogrom in, in Vilna, uh, Vilno, Vilnius. Uh, the result of his research is kind of swept under the carpet and, and that um, leaves him profoundly embittered and, uh, and he emigrates. Now he remains in contact uh, among other people with um, with Handelsmann. He's included in uh, celebrating Handelsmann big scholarly anniversary, but he's part and not part of it. But, but thank you very much for mentioning his name because I think that this, this cohort, and that's aside from burned libraries and burned personal collections, uh, um, Another project, another difficulty, but something that made it fascinating of this cohort is that th this is an amorphous cohort, right? Th this is not a, a group that has some kind of association. They don't have one journal that, you know, either you're in or not. Uh, it has a very porous uh, um, uh, um, limits uh, of who is in and, and who is out. So I would say that Shatsky is one foot in and one foot out. Interesting. Um, I, I've gotten a few questions that I'll combine actually about this, the general academic environment and, and people in academia and their, their reception of these historians. Um, so uh, one person would like to know, um, <clears throat> actually he's sending you regards, Richard Fisher. <laughs> um, would, would like to know about uh, whether ancient history is at all a factor. You um, talk a lot about their obsession, you call it, with, with recent Polish um, fights for independence and 19th century, they wanna clearly be part of that. Was anyone doing serious research on, on ancient Judaism in, in this cohort and also, um, uh, Paul Wright would like to know whether there were non-Jewish students of history who became interested in this. You write in your first chapter about some non-Jewish historians who had published and in, in a way set this whole thing off. Um, but this so is the, uh, two great, really great questions. And I think that they, you know, I'm also looking nervously at the clock because I, I, I know that I need to keep it short. Uh, there are, there are people who write on ancient, they're not really students of Bawaban, um, and they tend to study, um, either at other universities or in a department of Semitics, they do write uh, these theses in the Institute of Judaic Studies. Um, and they tend to be on a path uh, towards uh, rabbinate. Um, um, they are usually studying to become rabbis, whether or not, uh, you know, the school actually um, produced uh, pulpit rabbis is a whole other uh, question. Uh, but I, this is where I drew the line because the project was uh, not only about interest in Jewish, in the Jewish past, but specifically in the Polish Jewish past uh, with all the political implications and, and motivations of and for it. Um, but yes, it's a broader context for sure. And then about non-Jewish non uh, um, historians. So while in the 19th century, the, and early 20th century, there's a number of uh, uh, people writing. Um, some of these texts are, shall we say, uh, imbued with um, a very uh, stereotypical thoughts on the, you know, the nature of, of the, the Jewish question and why Jews are a certain way and how this is rooted in the past, their um, proclivity for commerce and money making and such. Uh, in, in the interwar period, um, I didn't find uh, much of it. It almost seems like for these liberal Polish historians who are welcoming their Jewish colleagues, it's sort of like, you know, 
you do the Jews. And, and some of the um, uh, older scholars even say this, you know, we don't know the languages. Uh, here are nice, these nice Polish Jews uh, who have the tools, let them do it. And these are scholars who say, yes, we need it. We need this historiography to have Polish historiography complete, but we're not going to do it ourselves. So that, that's a fair point actually about the language, uh, the linguistic limitations. Um, <clears throat> I, I have a, uh, a question from one of my students, Audrey McGill, who uh, is back to the gender question. She, she was wondering whether you have any way of knowing if any women's work uh, was published under gender neutral or male names in order to have their work included in the larger conversation? I don't think so. I think this was too small of a group to have, um, they to have, have even known. space for right. that, uh, that, that kind of strategy. Um, but it's an interesting question. Um, maybe something to ask of more in terms of uh, popular press, but the, this kind of in between academia and popular writing, I think people were very much identified as who they were. And, uh, and, and finally, before I, I have a, a final question that I want to ask you, but um, Helen Sonnenshine, uh, one of our great uh, friends of the Center of Israel Studies for Israel Studies at AU um, and a student of history would like to know, uh, of course, um, Ringel Bloom, as you mentioned, is, is the best known of these historians and, uh, and for, in large part, thanks to Sam Cassos incredible research about the, the Warsaw Ghetto archives uh, on Shabbos. We know what happened during the war. Um, and we know that some of those materials were found after the war from that archive that was created during the war. But Helen would like to know what other major repositories of materials have survived the war of uh, Polish Jewry. And in essence, what, so what are you using? Well, in a way, that's not what I'm using, um, but uh, um, there, is, um, there is the archive uh, partially legal, and that's the interesting difference with uh, Onek Shabbos um, uh, of the Litzmannstadt ghetto, Lodge ghetto. Um, larger ghettos, um, there's some uh, material left from Krakow ghetto, there's some material left uh, from um, um, Lvov uh, ghetto. Uh, um, so uh, these are, whatever files are uh, survived, uh, usually con connected to uh, Judenrat activities, sort of continuity of um, uh, communal institutions and Jewish self-help uh, records, uh, which, uh, which the center of was in Krakow, but the archive is in the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw, and um, a, a great deal of uh, interesting research uh, is now being being done based on it. But I was th this was in a way not connected to that um, project of collecting material. I know uh, from mentions that uh, some of Balaban's students were involved in. Um, never realized projects of, of the degree to which they re resembled on like Shabbos, uh, for example, in Lemberg, but uh, no um, underground archive in the end uh, um, was, was created. Thank you so much. Um, we are just about out of time. So I just, just want to note that, um, you know, you, despite your own, um, assertion that it's important, and I agree with you, that it's important to look at these subjects, trying to uh, disassociate our, our knowledge of what happened afterwards, you do end in your epilogue on a very personal note with almost a martyrology, really, of the, uh, of the fates and, and mostly the deaths of, of many of these historians during the war. Um, on the other hand, in doing this, it's almost like you have voluntarily taken this burden or placed this mantle on your own shoulders. And you talk about continuity and it's clear that um, you really, you're carrying this forward and, and your work is 
the continuity of what was started in the 19th century. And I think that not only bringing their work to light, but creating your own work, um, you very likely will inspire others, uh, Polish and non-Polish historians to go back and take very serious looks at the work of these historians. And, and for that, I think the, the whole historical community has to thank you. And I thank you so, so much. It's wonderful. And I thank everybody for joining us today. And, uh, and we hope to see you for the last installment of this particular series, which will be on Wednesday, March 2nd uh, at one o'clock also where um, my colleague, Pam Nadell, whom you saw at the beginning, will interview our colleague, Michael Brenner, about his fascinating new book on the Jews of Munich. So same time, same place on March 2nd. And although that will be the last installment in this particular series, we will then be starting a new wonderful series on modern Israeli writers, with the first, uh, the first meeting of that on Tuesday, March 15th with Israeli writer David Grossman. So stay tuned and please email uh, the Center for Israel Studies if you would like to get information about that. Thank you again. Thank you, Natalia. Again. Bye everyone. <laughs>